somebody to turn the paper for me. Did somebody come? Where are you? I can't see anything. Oh, there you are. You work here? I thought you were bleeding. That's oh. all right. <laughs> they must have fertilized you a lot. <laughs> so, what can I do for you? Oh, yes, I call you again. Don't go by this. Don't go by that. Isn't that interesting? This 200 years from back, from the time it was 200 years ago, at this day. Oh, yeah. Now, uh, you said you work here? What do you do? I call the lights. No, I said you, you said you work. So what do you do? I call the lights. What do you call the lights? <laughs> what happens if the lights don't come when you call them? I do. Long time no see. <laughs> Are you afraid your hand will fall off? <laughs> well, same on the back of the way. Oh, now I remember. Would you be kind enough to turn the pages when I had a problem there? I should have had a book. Lucy is very difficult. Nice fellow, a little dopey, but he's silly. When I'm playing, of course. <laughs> okay. tell you what to do and what not to do, and particularly where not to do it. This is a man, no, no, please. <laughs> Chinese egg rolls. That is an Italian abbreviation for very soft, very soft, piano pianissimo. Just the opposite of which, uh, something like When I say now, you will be kind enough to turn this, sing the page. Just the one, sing the page. 
whoop, like this. Whoop, the what? Whoop, whoop. Whoop. I can't hear you. Whoop, whoop. For what? Whoop. Whoop. What did you say that? Whoop. And I said, now you will turn this sink because I go here. Then I come over here and I play it down to about here where it begins to be difficult. <laughs> One, this is Rinkus Traum by Frist. It's a nice piece. Hope you will enjoy it. Excuse me. It's Frist. That's what I said, Frist. No, it's, it's F. List. F. List, young man, is Flist. <laughs> you don't say M. Ozart. Molto tedioso. What does that mean? That means the great dullness. I don't think you would like that. Not the way you came in there. Yeah, that's it. Don't go, there. please, please, for me. Okay. You have to be quiet. Okay. Shh. That's the Spanish composer, El Beethoven. <laughs> Made a mistake. No, that's the way I wrote it. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Fascinating. You think that was fascinating? Well, you can 
come back later and watch me tie my shoes. <laughs> I'd like to take you to the piano now and show you how a modern composer today composes a modern song hit. He will have on the piano a batch of music, some old, some new, all kinds of music, a pair of scissors, and some uh, glue, you know, big hole like this. And now <clears throat> I would like to show you how to compose a song hit, we hope, in a jiffy. Let us take, for instance, uh, Brahms on top here. Johannes Brahms, J. Brahms. <laughs> There's a lively one. <laughs> ah, that's too slow. Uh, Tchaikovsky, Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky. This is something here. Schubert, the wonderful composer. He was a very poor composer. He wasn't a poor composer, he was a poor man. He was a <laughs> fine composer. And here's his Sarah New, Nate. <laughs> well, I always have my glasses with me. You see, these are very lovely glasses. They're cut here, like Benjamin Franklin's, because I don't need glasses, so I can see over them when I look at them. <laughs> but for now, I can get along without them anyway. That's a lovely theme, and nobody will know that. So we will cut out a little of this. That'll never be popular. <laughs> you know, I'll make it so that nobody will recognize it. Fine. Now we have a little glue here. Now, for our next edition, a little Debussy, Claude Debussy, the French composer by the same name. <laughs> Claude Debussy, unfortunately, is dead, as you probably have heard. And I sincerely hope he is, because they buried him quite a few years ago. <laughs> According to Ed Sullivan's column, of course. <laughs> Incidentally, that also happened to Mrs. Debussy, I'm sorry. <laughs> the whole family. <laughs> well, lovely people, fine people, but that's the way it goes. Well, I don't care, I have my own problems. <laughs> I didn't even know them. <laughs> but I happen to know a couple who live here in New York, an elderly couple who knew them very, very well. They were very close to them like this. And they've known, they known for, me for years. And they have told me all of it. It's very interesting to hear people sit and talk about such greatness being so far remote from them. They really knew them well. Love it. They hated them. show them uh, show you a collector's item I have here many few people 
Very few people, which is the same as many few people. <laughs> Don't get into French any minute. Envy me this little collection here. This, ladies and gentlemen, in this little box is the first note that Wolfgang Mozart ever wrote in his life. Isn't that the cutest thing? Can you see it? Well, it doesn't matter. It's here anyway. And this is a B. <laughs> Think of that, that little cute Mozart. This is the first note he ever wrote. And here I have, in the other hand, or now in the same hand, <laughs> The last note Mozart wrote after 30 years in composing. Isn't that something? I'm thrilled with these two things. The second note is a C. And this is the last Mozart ever wrote. In other words, I have from his first note to his last note. <laughs> Actually, I don't think he went very far, do you? <laughs>
tonight, we take pride in demonstrating for the first time the phenomenal discovery of the time window. The time window was developed by an obscure network vice president who was dozing one night before his television set and inadvertently short-circuited his remote control switch by dropping it into a plate of 100-year-old turtle soup. And to his amazement, this gentleman found himself watching a Civil War movie with the original cast, an event that occurred exactly 100 years ago. Well, tonight, through the miracle of the time window, we present the first in our new gallery of television portraits of colorful geniuses and historic figures of a century ago. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as you gaze into the time window, we take you to the home of the eminent Hungarian composer Franz Liszt. And in so doing, we set television back 100 years. <laughs> are you there, Mr. Liszt? Mr. Liszt, are you there? <laughs> I certainly are, Mr. Wallace. <laughs> and how are you, Mr. Wallace? I am fine, thank you. And how do you feel, Mr. Lee? Oh, I feel wonderful because Anderson doesn't upset my stomach. <laughs> We've been admiring your splendid home, all the stately chambers, mammoth furnishings. And I was most impressed with your beautiful formal garden. I noticed the geraniums coming up the front walk. Are those darn geraniums coming up the front walk again? <laughs> Would you please tell us just a little bit about your exquisite home? For instance, the interesting pictures on the wall over there? Oh, yes, I'm glad you asked that. Yes, Wallace, this is what I call my composer's corner. These are the composers of my most favorite uh, compositions, I may say. There I am, six years old. <laughs> music you have framed there on the wall. No, that is a piece of music I have framed there on the wall. <laughs> uh, this happens to be my first composition. <laughs> uh, it is not a very impressive composition, but it is a very important composition. May I play it for you, Mr. Please, Wallace? Please. I told you it was not very impressive, but it is important. Here it is. We hadn't written this. We would never have had this. <laughs> I, I understand. <laughs> Mr. Liz, while you have uh, conquered the world with your pianism, to say nothing of your composing, to whom do you feel that you owe all your success? My mother. <laughs> she was very, very lovely. Her name was lovely. Christmas was her name. <laughs> Christmas Liszt. <laughs> With your permission, sir, I, I wonder if I may change the subject. Everyone is interested in the uh, in the amours of a great artist. Uh, it's common knowledge that you have known many women in your lifetime. Now, without going into details, of course, would you care to comment on your relationship? by beautiful women in every country. The terrible price the artist has to pay for the art. <laughs> I have played all over the world. Piano, of course. <laughs> Is the lady whom I see in the love seat beside you uh, Mrs. List by any chance? The lady you see beside me in the love seat is not Mrs. List, and she hasn't got a chance. <laughs> Uh, let's just say that she's an old friend and dropped the subject. <laughs> I keep her here for balance. <laughs> Franz Liszt, have you ever thought of writing an opera? No, frankly, I haven't. But I met 
Joe Green yesterday on the street, and this is very interesting. Joe Green? Yes, Joe Green. Oh, you mean, you mean Giuseppe Ferret? Oh, that's his stage name. <laughs> we met, and he suggested something about Aida. I don't even know her. No, I wasn't interested in anything like that. Well, you might be interested to know, Mr. Liff, that uh, there is now a movie in our country based on your life. Is that so? What's the name of that? Uh, it's called Song Without End. It covers your entire brilliant career. And you certainly did have a brilliant career. Yes, except for that very, very bad year, 1887. Well, what happened in 1887? I died. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to hear That's that. life. <laughs> but you certainly did have a brilliant life. All, all of those triumphs. <laughs> <laughs> As the flower of the musical oh, world, so, Mr. So. Liz, with all of that adulation, I'm amazed that your success hasn't gone to your head. Well, I'll tell you... <laughs> Excuse me just a second. I'm a chain sniffer. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Wallace. I have, in my youth, been very conceited. As a matter of fact, I was always very conceited. That has all changed now. Now I'm perfect. <laughs> yes. And it's surprising how you still manage to retain your modesty, sir. <coughs> you, uh, you played for royalty many times, did you not, Mr. List? Yes, I did. But, uh, oh, kings, queens, jacks. <laughs> Countesses and so forth. They seem to... Well, they don't understand my music. But the food is good. <laughs> well, if they don't understand your music, why do you play for Roy? Because I get five extra points when I take a civil service examination. <laughs> <laughs> what is your unbiased opinion, sir, about your contemporary composers? Have you, for instance, heard Johann Strauss' Tales of the Vienna Woods? Oh, but I heard a cute one about a musician's daughter. Uh, <laughs> something like that. Uh, what do you think of Brahms? Who? Johannes Brahms. Oh, Joe Brahms? The fellow from, uh, from Hamburg? <laughs> he writes for babies. <laughs> what do you expect from a hamburger? <laughs> Chopin? Well, he used to be a good friend of mine, but he got in with a bad crowd. <laughs> he was running around with this woman. What was her name? Uh, uh, what was her name? George? <laughs> Are you trying to be funny, maybe? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, sir, but her name was George. You're sick! <laughs> George Sand. George Sand. I am sorry. I am, I am sorry. Yes, I apologize, of course. The one who smoked my cigar. Yes. yes. <laughs> no, the only thing he wrote that ever came in handy was the minute walls. Because I have to use it every morning. Before breakfast, I push my piano out to the kitchen, and then I play the minute walls three times, and my eggs are done. <laughs> I uh, think, sir, that perhaps you're losing interest in this turn in the conversation. Perhaps we'd better go back to talking about you. Now you're wising up. <laughs> you probably know my Hungarian rhapsodies, number one, number three, four, five, six. Uh, well, I just wrote the second one, number two. <laughs> little behind with that one, but nevertheless, I should play that for you, maybe. Will you play us a little of it? No. Nope. I'll play it all. <laughs> Mr. Wallace, isn't this a gorgeous hand? <laughs> Absolutely gorgeous. Another one like it. <laughs> Who these fingers has the most beautiful music walked in the world. Walked. 
I'm sorry, I cannot play this one alone. It was written for four hands, because that way we get through with it a little faster. <laughs> I'm going to give you a lesson in a language I have invented, which I call the inflationary language. <laughs> Everything with numbers in it is going up and up and up, except the language. I have to explain it this way, that we will add one to each number in every word that contains a number. For instance, one, uh, number one in wonderful will be wonderful because we add one to it. <laughs> Four will be be five. Three eight will be three nine. Tennis will be eleven. <laughs> a sentence like I ate a tenderloin with my fork will be a nine and eleven loin with my fork. <laughs> I'm going to read to you from a book, just a short chapter, not a chapter, but a paragraph. This is a book written by a Russian author. Russian author. It's not a very good book, but I don't read the whole thing anyway. He is Ivanovich Falofov, Sonovovich, Sonovovich, Sonovovich. These are short, these are short stories, very short stories. The shortest stories that, is a, that are available, actually, because they are so bad that there was no reason to make them any longer. <laughs> and he writes, here, for instance, is one about Tchaikovsky. See under T. <laughs> are you laying eggs? <laughs> See under Peter Ilyas Tchaikovsky, he says, seafood, what, oh, seafood note. <laughs> Peter was born in Watkinsk, but never played down in the streets of Watkinsk like the other little children of Watkinsk, because when he was two months old, his parents moved to St. Petersburg. <laughs> That's the kind of stories he is writing. Now I'm going to find the one I'm going to read to you. Twice upon a time, there lived in sunny California a young man named Bob. He was a little Lebanon in the air fives. <laughs> Bob had been very fond of Anna, his one and a half sister, ever since he saw the light of day for the second time. They were proud of the fact that two of the five fathers were among the crinanders of the U.S. Constitution. <laughs> now they were dining on the terrace. Anna, said Bob as he took a bite of marinated herring. <laughs> you look beautiful, Trinite. You never look so lovely be five. Anna really looked tutorful in spite of the illness from which she had not yet recuperated. <laughs> yes, repeated Bob, you look tutorful. <laughs> but you have three of the saddest eyes I have ever seen. <laughs> the table was tastefully decorated with Anna's favorite flowers, three lips. They were talking about Anna's as a ten husband. <laughs> That's a difficult one. As a ten husband. You got it? <laughs> From whom she was separated. They were talking about Anna's acetan husband from whom she was separated. While on the radio, an Irish 11 was singing T53. <laughs> I didn't get that one. <laughs> it was midnight, a clock in the distance struck 13. And suddenly, there in the moonlight stood her husband, Don Two. Ah, 
obviously intoxicated. <laughs> Having just had two, three many. <laughs> Anna, he blurted, you are no longer my two and only. <laughs> but Bob jumped to his feet. Get out of here, you three-faced triple-crosser. <laughs> and Anna warned, be careful, Bob, you're talking to an officer. Aha, said Bob, is he two? I'm two, three. <laughs> well, I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll wait. All right, said Don Two, as he wiped his five head. <laughs> Farewell, Anna, five ever and ever. Three to loo, three to loo. <laughs> What's your name? Sergio Franchi. Sergio! Now, I have one big wish. And since I, I say that in form to show, we can do almost anything that is... <laughs> in, well, in decency. Um, may I accompany you to one song? You play for me? I love you. What would you like to sing in this case? Uh, it's now or never. It's what? It's now or never. It's now or never. It's now or never. Right? It's now or never. Right. <laughs> oh, uh, I need a, a, a page turner. <clears throat> I don't care what you look like. Just... <laughs> you again, huh? <laughs> Seems that we are. Uh, all you do is turn when I not. When when I do not not, don't turn. <laughs> Understand? It's now never. Yeah, it sure is. <laughs> I got never here. Where's now? <laughs> it won't be now if you don't get ever. <laughs> there it is. Can you read?
in the I conducted the, the magic flute, Mozart's great opera. I found in, in my research an opera actually written by Mozart, but it said Salieri <laughs> on it. But it is understood that Mozart actually wrote it, so you can imagine what kind of opera it is, and put Salieri's name on it. <laughs> well, anyway, I'll tell you a little about it because it's quite interesting. It is in, in one act only. It begins with a 45 minutes intermission <laughs> because it's such a short opera. And when it, the curtain rises, first you hear the overture, but when the tour is over, the curtain rises, of course. Otherwise, you couldn't see a thing. And on the stage are two large trees. One is on this side and one is on the other side. And that indicates a small forest. Now the tenor comes in, he's supposed to meet his soprano, but she hasn't arrived yet, so he hides behind one of the trees in order to surprise her when she comes in a little later which she does. And when she comes in a little later, which she does, she can't find him because he is hidden behind the tree. And she doesn't know that. Of course she knows it because she must have seen it during rehearsals. <laughs> but she pretends. Either that or she is plain stupid. <laughs> well, she now hides behind the other tree waiting for him, and he's there already, so this is a little mess. Now the chorus comes in, but nobody knows why except Mozart, and he's dead. <laughs> Finally, her father shows up. He's very angry because he just wants to get out of the opera as fast as possible and go home. <laughs> and he decides that she must die, and she sings her, die aria, her death aria, and uh, that's the end of it. The curtain falls, but not hard enough. And uh, I'll take you to the opera and play for you the overture. First we hear the conductor's footsteps when he enters the orchestra pit. As a matter of fact, I like to call it the orchestra ditch. <laughs> That's a little more dignified, I think. Pit. First you hear the conductor's footsteps when he enters the orchestra pit, or ditch, <laughs> he walks sideways because it's a very narrow ditch. And this is the overture. <laughs> the first part of the overture. Now you're going to hear the second part and that's exactly the same. Now this is the blip. The reason for that extra blip is that the fellow who does the blips started one measure too late. Now the curtain rises, and the tenor comes in from that side in a single file. comes in, she's supposed to fill the part of the soprano. She not only fills it, <laughs> she overflows it a little bit. She's a big, she's a big, uh, uh, she carries a lot of weight to the opera. <laughs> she's about four and a half feet tall, lying down.
He comes in from that side in a single pile. it completely. <laughs> well, while you were laughing, the chorus has been in and out, <laughs> and now a baritone arrives. But he finds out that he's in the wrong opera. <laughs> so he's fired. Now the father comes in, the ill bustle. up from there and sings her death between the two big trees there on the stage. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Vedder. I'm, I'm extremely sorry. I have only that one orchestration, so I could not sing an hour because my accompanist, you know, he's still in Europe. And, oh, that is yeah. just too bad. Yes, now, yes. ladies and gentlemen, we have to go on with the show. Uh, well, 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 of course, I would like I would like to sing an encore. Uh, oh, sure, uh, yeah, because, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. you know, if you could, if you could uh, perhaps, uh, I, 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 I have no accompanist, but you could perhaps, uh, if you would. Well, I don't sing, you know, that's it. That's, uh, I'm, I'm well, I mean, I mean, if you would. Uh, oh, if I would, yeah, but I don't, yeah. I don't think the audience wants another one, actually. <laughs> There are a lot of people here from Toledo. <laughs> That's all I can say. Okay, Lawrence, if you want me to, let's step to the piano. Thank you. After Thank you, sir. Lawrence, you know I haven't accompanied anybody for years. Well, now I'm a soloist myself, you know. I, uh, <laughs> oh, well, I shall try. I uh, would like to know what are you going to say? Uh, come back to Sorrento. Thank you. Very much. Uh, must have been somebody who haven't heard it before. <laughs> Uh, Flowers, you know, when I used to be in a company, that I had three kinds of accompaniment. Yeah. One, yeah. I charged $200. That was excellent. That was brilliant. Of course, you could hardly hear the singer in that one. <laughs> and I had one for about, I would say, $150. That wasn't so hot, you mm -hmm. know. <laughs> you know, what can you do with one hand after all? It's, it's... <laughs> then I had what, one for $100 for that one. I. Oh, I know, I know that one, and I, that, I, you know. I know that one, yeah. Which one do you wish? Oh, I, I leave it up to you, uh, what you think. Okay. <laughs> Don't cost you much tonight. <laughs> okay, may I hear your A, please? 
I like mine better. <laughs> oh, but there's something in the piano that's not supposed to be. <laughs> that must be from another show. Please take that one. Sorrento? Hmm. Guarda il mare come bello, spira tanto sentimento. Welcome, Mr. Shahan Azruni. That's all that's left of him after the age. <laughs> he used to be a left man. Anyway, Shahan, uh, Shahan lives in New York City with his family and has not been in the United States very long, and uh, uh, he doesn't speak English. He understands a little. Uh, fortunately, I speak a little Turkey, so he I, I can understand. He understand me, and I. We will play together because the time is very precious. We, have, we don't have much time, otherwise we would play two pianos, but uh, we cut it down to one piano. <laughs> We will play the second Hungarian Rhapsody by Liszt. <laughs> the second. <laughs>
your arms. There might be a Mozart for it. <laughs> Merlin has sung in many operas and has also not sung, sung in many operas. Also not sung in many operas, yes. Sung in many operas and has also not sung in many operas. That's, uh, exactly what I meant and that's exactly what I said. Hands off, please. She has a habit. You shouldn't lean against the pianos, Marilyn, because sometimes there might not be a pina piano, a piano next to you when, when you sing. Maybe a flute player. You can't hang on to the flute. <laughs> and you can't flout the flute. <laughs> Marilyn is celebrating, actually, today she's celebrating her second wedding anniversary. Is that true? <laughs> That's really an anniversary. How long were you married? <laughs> oh, two years, yes, that's, I, I see, that's what it is, yeah. That's the second anyway. <laughs> Hands off, please. <laughs> what have you chosen to sing for us this evening? I'd like to start with a folk song. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, one of the folk songs your uncle brought from, from where? Croatia. Croatia. Yeah, that's right. Her uncle is an archaeologist and has been archaeologizing recently <laughs> in the very far where Croatia is. And uh, he found in an old monkery in the basement of the monastery. monastery. <laughs> well, you can say nunnery. Why can't you say monkery? But well, anyway, that's not my problem. <laughs> but well, anyway. Ah, yeah. Hands up, dude. <laughs> Melanie's uncle brought back some manuscripts he found in that, uh, where we were. And uh, there are six songs, and Marilyn sings uh, all six. Not now, but she knows them all. These are some old folk songs for the old folks, uh, for some uh, old folks. And uh, which one have you chosen to sing tonight, Marilyn? I wasn't sure. What do you think I should start with? Sing the one you like the most. Oh, yes. Because I'm going to play the one I like. <laughs> Oh, no, no, I, I tried not to. Marilyn, rem <laughs> she wants me to say, don't hum along because, you know, musicians, when we play, for instance, you play a concerto, you sit there, and you sing along without really knowing it. You hum, or the violins, you do all these things. <laughs> and I have the habit myself, and I must remember that. Hands up, please. This is one of those songs, or two of them, actually, because, oh. And if you don't know the song you're going to sing, don't sing it. <laughs> you're an opera singer. You should sing opera. Marilyn is a cagliatura. 
And she said, why don't you sing an aria from one of this? You, you like arias? Wait till you hear what she's going to say. Thank you. When this ovation has died down. <laughs> what have you chosen to sing then? I'd like to sing the Karunome from Rigoletto. Oh, God. <laughs> All right, for the ones of you who are staying, <laughs> Marilyn will sing the Kagame, the what? The Kaganomi. Kaganomi aria from the opera Rico Mortis. <laughs> by, by all means. <laughs> who wrote that, Marilyn? Uh, Giuseppe Verdi. Why? I mean, why yes, why yes, why yes, that's an expression, why yes, it's your language, I'm just trying to use it, that's all, why yes, Giuseppe Verdi, Joe Green to you. I can help it. What's the matter? Don't you know it? <laughs> oh, one more. It's mine. mine. Sorry.
We do have an agreement. She doesn't touch my piano. I don't lay hands on her coloratura. <laughs> Said that <laughs> twice. I thought you had that fixed. story right here in the beginning of the book. Page nine. Oh. Page six. In the open window there suddenly came light. Beautiful Eleanor sat alone, dreaming of but one Two years had passed since she met Sir Henry. She would still remember the unhappy evening when her father had thrown him out. They had been sitting in the park and Henry had said, darling. Is this the first time you have loved the <laughs> And she had answered, yes. <laughs> but it is so wonderful that I hope it shall not be the last. Suddenly she heard a well-known sound. It was he. In two strides he was near her. Embraced, kissed, and caressed her. <laughs> Henry! <laughs> what is love? <laughs> she asked. He answered. without Suddenly he had gone. Oh. <laughs> All she heard, heard. <laughs> All she heard was the well-known sound of his departing horse. 